Hey, welcome to Gold's Garage. So this uh, video is the second video in a series of this new project that I have going on. And the previous series of videos, we made 10 videos on Mike Kimball's budget build. And as I mentioned in version one of this uh, series, this isn't a budget build. This is the opposite of a budget build. I went for it. Uh, everything is brand new in this engine. All the machining is high end and uh, this is going to be a high-end piece so I wanted nothing but the best for it so I'm going to get to the issue of the video which is the issues that I have with the AFR heads a uh, couple updates from the last time uh, when I did it I showed most of the parts and if you're interested uh, I made a list of all the parts that we used and all the things that we're doing to this engine uh, this quickly though it's actually 11 to 1 static compression ratio, roller cam, uh, AFR heads, as I mentioned. Everything else in it is uh, first class. Uh, this engine's got splayed four bolt main caps uh, and, uh, and full rotating assembly, eagle rotating assembly. So the only thing I couldn't show last time because I didn't have it, uh, the vibration damper or harmonic balancer, whatever you call it, on the engine is just one I use for a mock up uh, for degreeing the camshaft. And this is the one that I just received today. It's, this one is an SFI steel uh, damper made by uh, Performance Quotient. So uh, this solves that problem. It will be SS, SFI approved. So just for what it's worth, uh, there's nothing wrong with a standard uh, harmonic balancer. Uh, the OEM balancers were actually harmonic balancer in the sense that they're two-piece and had uh, some medium in between them that helped to absorb torsional vibration and so that's important and and you can actually make some people are worried about because it's big and heavy you can actually make more power with the big and heavy one if it's designed properly because it absorbs the torsional vibrations in the crankshaft and reduces the harmonics in the engine so uh, that's one reason to use this balancer in this engine so uh, that's the last of the main parts that I wanted to talk about uh, since the last video, I did a mock-up and I've checked piston to valve clearance over 300 thousandths of an inch piston to valve clearance. I checked rocker arm, uh, uh, push rod ratio, push rod length and rocker arm uh, engagement. That's all good. And I'm not making a video of that right now, but there are videos on my channel that I did in the past of all these functions. If you want to find them, uh, everything I'm talking about, I videoed before. So... Uh, before I go any further and get to the point of it, uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, we just passed 4,000 subscribers a little while ago, and so we're encouraged to keep going. The issue for me is getting the chance to make the videos. We've got work to do and coordination to take place, but we're doing our best to get information out there for anyone that's interested in listening that could be helpful, and uh, sometimes you can learn by my experience. So here's uh, one of the experiences I need to talk about. When I listed the parts on the last video, one of the things I was most proud of is I went for AFR heads, aluminum cylinder heads. These are 200 cc uh, uh, intake port volume, 65 cc combustion chamber volume, uh, and they are designed specifically for uh, 400 cubic inch inches, and they actually come with the steam holes. And I showed that detail in the previous video. So. One of the things I did different in this procedure, building this engine, usually you assemble all the engine, you get it running, you start it up, and then I take a leak down test with my leak down tester. And if you go back to the previous series of videos on Mike Kimball's engine, we found some leaking valves when we did the leak down test. So I decided this time uh, not to get uh, tricked into that. So I mocked it up, put, I've actually had both heads on, that one's a back off already. But I put cylinder heads on with a distant old gasket. I torqued it down just about 30 foot pounds. I don't need a lot of torque pressure uh, just to uh, enable me to do a leak down test while the engine, before the engine's ever been started. So first thing, the leak down is going to be a little higher because the pistons and rings have never you know, been run in an operating condition. And so the rings will seed in and the numbers will get better. But uh, what I'm really looking for is sealing of intake and exhaust valves. There's three ways 
you can lose pressure in the leak down and one of them is going by the rings which is normal there always is some even in a really well uh, machine uh, mature engine and for what it's worth uh, for calibration I checked the cylinder on my Camaro and it's got 9% leak down. That's about as good a number as I've ever seen on any engine with my gauge. Now, gauges may vary, but I've checked, I mentioned before, probably 100 engines with it, and that's as good a number as I've ever seen. Typically, on a new engine, before the rings are broken in, if you're under 20%, you're feeling pretty good about it. And when it's all said and done, anything between 10 and 15 is a pretty good number with this gauge based on experience with lots of engines. So uh, I wanted to do that to check these heads because there are lots of videos about uh, aftermarket heads, aluminum heads saying, you know, don't just take them out of the box and put them on the engine. Uh, you need to check them out. So I thought the best way to check it out to determine whether there's any leakage is to do a leak down test. No intention of starting the engine like this. This head's coming back off and but I did the leak down test and here's what I found. Brand new AFR heads. Uh, I purchased these heads from Skip White Performance. They're specially made once again for 400s. And I got some leaking valves. And uh, I've talked to the supplier and I was told that, ah, it's not serious, don't worry about it, run it and it'll be okay. And I'm in a conundrum right now to decide what I'm gonna do. Am I gonna take these heads all apart and and redo the valve job or am I going to lap them in or as he said run it and it'll just be fine. Interesting thing point I want to thing I want to point out if you don't test you don't know so probably 90 out of 90 percent of these type of heads go on an engine they get started and run and nobody ever knows the difference so and the other thing how much difference will it make well I'm going to show you so we've got our leak down tester pressurized and I'm going to pressurize this cylinder and then what I'm going to do is spray a little. One of the things I do when I'm testing, I just put a, uh, some duct tape over the port before I pressurize the cylinder. And if the duct tape pops off, I know I've got a leak. Uh, but one of the other ways I want to be able to, to demonstrate, once I hook up the leak down tester, the cylinder's pressurized. And we're going to spray some, uh, just some, some uh, brake clean in there. And Alex is going to bring the camera around and you can actually see the bubbles coming out where we have leakage. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to hook up and we'll see what kind of numbers we get. So the, easy, the reason we do the leak down test like this, all the valves are already closed. We don't have to worry about where the cylinder is or whatever. But once again, that number is a little high for a, a normal engine that doesn't have any leakage. We'll get our light out, got a light on the camera. So 25, we're at 25% leak down. Spray some brake clean in there. And Yali can get in there and see, you can actually see the bubbles coming past the valve. So watch yourself, Alec. I'm going to give it a little pop here just to get that is exhaust valve. So we're here. Sometimes that makes a little bit of a difference. So I'm down to about 20% leak down. And once again, when the rings are not broken in yet, that wouldn't actually be that bad of a number. But it uh, doesn't change the fact that I still have still have some bubbles coming out of there. So something I have to deal with and I'm going to make a decision as to whether I run this engine. If I do run it, I will actually, sorry, Alec. I will, of course, once I run it on my test stand, I'll do another leak down test, check it again. Uh, hopefully it's going to be gone away. If it's good enough, we'll take it to the dyno, run it again. If it's still leaking after the dyno, then this thing just coming back apart and we're going to fix the problem. So it's not a big deal, but if you assume that just because you paid a lot of money for something, there's not going to be any problems or you don't have to check it out, uh, there's an example that you can think about. 
Hope you found that interesting. Watch for future videos. I've also got a nice uh, Cloy's aluminum cover coming for the timing gear so I can adjust the camshaft. This is a roller camshaft and once again the description of that is in the previous video and that's going to finish off the front end. This balancer is coming off. The new SFI balancer is going on and uh, hopefully we'll get this thing together. Okay, one other point, uh, talking about our 400, uh, we, there's other videos on my channel about uh, static and dynamic compression, how to calculate that, how much you need, etc. And so, first of all, you need to know your static compression, and now you can go online, there's more than one. Summit has a great uh, uh, static compression calculator. Plug in the numbers, and it does all the math for you and gives you your static compression. You need to know your combustion chamber volume of your heads, how far down the hole your, your piston is at top dead center, how big the valve reliefs are, how thick your head gasket is, uh, and your boring stroke to do that. Once you know that, then you need to know something called dynamic compression. So dynamic compression is the actual compression that your engine sees. And the reason it's different is because any camshaft that's high performance will have the intake valve closed well after bottom dead center. If it closed at bottom dead center, then the dynamic compression would be the same as the static compression, <clears throat> but it doesn't. So I've already turned this engine, this, this camshaft, Howard's cam, the intake valve closes at 68 degrees after bottom dead center. So I've got it there. And you can do something as simple as measure where the piston is when the valve closes, so it's 2.87. So, take my calculator. So let's assume it had 10 to 1 compression, just to make it easy. You multiply by 2.87 divided by 3.75. And so your static compression, your dynamic compression will be 7.565, or very close to it. Now, I did this pretty quick, but uh, it's a way that you can do to validate your calculations for static and dynamic compression uh, before you assemble the engine. You do all the math, but you need to know exactly where it is, and this will, it's that simple. It really, dynamic compression is less because the farther your piston is up before it starts compressing, the less dynamic compression you're going to have. So uh, that's the reason for doing that, and hope you found that interesting. If you want to check it out and try it for yourself, let me know how it works. 